I welcome everyone to this session on what you should know about operation theater. Uh, Ilan has actually given more time to this session based on the feedback from last year's conference. So I hope people would get some answers to the questions they have been looking for. So chairman for our session is Dr. Chand Shekhar. Uh, Dr. Chand Shekhar, I know him for many, many years and he I interacted with, first with him when we wrote the NABH eye care standards. He was working with Arvind Eye Hospital at that time. Now also he's involved as a consultant. He's not a full-time employee at Arvind. Before that, he has worked in other hospitals in Coimbatore and he has been very much involved with the NABH and quality implementation and improvement. But a couple of things which we probably don't know is he has got a keen knowledge and interest in hospital infection control. So if you really want to discuss any time offline with him, he's a nice person to really understand it a is. He's also one of a very interactive and interesting quiz masters for quiz and is well known for that in Tamil Nadu and Kerala conferences. So, you know, if you could anytime get those videos, you would enjoy his style of having the quiz. And most other thing is he's a passionate teacher. If you see his PowerPoints, they are so amazingly made. And he also runs an online training program. So he's also interested in teaching and he has got that knack of teaching. All of us can't teach, but he's the one who really can teach. So I welcome him for this session and I really feel we have conducted many, many sessions before. So I believe I know part of his content. It's going to be an interesting talk. Yeah, and then you, along Dr. with Garvin. them, we have our co-chairman, Dr. Savita Arun. She also dons multiple hat at Netradhama Hospital. She's a medical superintendent. She takes care of the entire quality program there. She's also involved with training of uh, optometrists there. And uh, if I'm not wrong, also is an assessor for uh, NABH. So other speakers will introduce as we go on. And uh, now I think so we can start with the first talk. First I invite Dr. Gagan to give deliver his first talk. Dr. Gagan is in charge of the Narayana Netralaya at uh, Narayana Hridalaya unit. He has been uh, one of the senior assessors, NABH assessors, who is an ophthalmologist. And he has been part of getting the NABH ICAR guidelines into play. We, we took one, hour, one year for us to get it into uh, proper form. And he is also an expert in all aspects of hospital management. And uh, over to you, Dr. Gagan. Thank you, Dr. Chanshekar. Nice to be with all friends here. I've actually been in session with everyone earlier. So uh, we have a very short session, but have got good topics. So the topic Ilan decided was ideal infrastructure for OT. Anyways, I can't cover ideal in 10 minutes. My OT talk itself is one hour plus. So in 10 minutes, what I thought we'll touch upon essential infrastructure for OT. So what certain things are very, very important when you are designing your OT or renovating. The whole thing is if you have an OT which is running, it is very difficult to do much now. It's only patchwork. But if you are trying to, you know, expand your facility, making a new OT or renovating, then, you know, these things are really good. Otherwise, old OTs, we really have our hands tied. So if you are designing a new OT, who should take a call? I have seen many ophthalmologists who themselves want to do it and they don't take help of anyone. Uh, personally, based on where you are and what hospital you are and what are your things, you definitely need to have some architect who is versed with hospital design. You take the in inputs of stakeholders in your hospital, your NSCZ team, your uh, OT team, they will tell what they really require in terms of functioning properly. And also take inputs from your biomedical person because he will also have significant experience and amount in the way you work or the city you work. In every state and every city, things change. In Bangalore, I have luxury of getting everything from Indian to imported. The moment you go into some interior of Karnataka or some other state, you may not have the same things available. I have traveled across India for NABH, huge difference in availability of materials. We have to anyways go with what is available locally. That's a thing which you have to go. So asking local people is good. Now, what is the main thing is, if you see all the IOTs are having some issues, but when I travel across to other hospitals, I go to ENT, I go to gynae, I go to general surgery, their OT are much better designed. I don't know why. When I have asked my seniors, the answer was, we copied our OT with what was by RP center. We copied from this medical college. We copied from this particular charitable setup. So somewhere down the line in 80s, ophthalmology OTs were probably designed by few people in a different way. And that has continued, whether that was due to the camp guidelines, whether that was due to you know the camp programs there, this. But ophthalmology OTs per se have more errors until any other speciality. So if you want to get ideas for making an OT, don't visit other ophthalmologists. See any other hospitals, see any other specialities, and their OTs are much, much better confirming to the you know, norms and standards what we expect than ophthalmology OT. So that would be my first experience I would like to share with you. Now the other question comes size of OT. 
big discussion, all confusion across the country. Uh, if you want to go with the standard size, IPHS standards specify 20 into 20 into 10, 10 is the height, excluding the false ceiling or the AHE or whatever we are putting. It's a clean height. It is the same thing in NBC also, old NABH, also OT guidelines were 20, 20 into 10, but then they took it off. Different states have their own recommendation. Kumran tells me that in Tamil Nadu, it is one, it is square feet. Delhi is 100, 150 odd square feet. Karnataka KPME Act says that we follow Central Clinical Establishment Act, which puts ophthalmology OT into category two, which is 24.5 square meter, roughly 264 square feet, which is about 16 into 16. Um, think practically, uh, if we don't have a guideline, what should be the size of OT? The practical way of looking at it is because square foot, it can't be that you have an OT of 20 to 10 and we say it is 200 square feet. So imagine an OT table and also look at AHU. So the table will be in the kind of center of OT. So table size is six into two. And going by that, you would need at least four feet towards the foot end and five to six feet towards the head end. You have to sit and you know, your trolleys and assistants have to come and you need four, four feet on the sides also for another trolley to move in the door to open and other things. So if you add that six plus four, 10 plus another five, 15 to 16 is what you want in length. Anything less than that, it becomes cramped. And on the sides, you need at least four, four feet. So four plus four, eight plus two, 10 is bare minimum where you will just squeeze in patients for local. But the moment you add GA machine, the moment you add new machines, the older machines and microscopes were small. And if you see the newer machines are all becoming big in size, the footprint is increasing, whether it's a anesthesia machine or whether it's a microscope or everything, I would still say you need another five, five. So it will become 12. So 12 into 12 into 14 or 12 into 15 is the bare minimum which you need. Anything less than that, very difficult to function. So that is some kind of a practical way you can consider in case your state does not have any guideline. But more and more with Establishment Act, probably sticking to what your state says makes sense. 20 into 20 will be too large. Other thing you have to consider is the occupancy of OT. If you are a teaching hospital with seven, eight people inside OT anytime, you need a bigger OT. When we are talking about smaller OTs, it's only about you know a surgeon and anesthetist and one circulating person and one assistant. So about four people can be accommodated in that much square foot area and, then, and one patient will be there. So that will be occupancy of five. Anything more, you have to have a bigger OT. Now, other question is the wall. Do we need a modular OT? Modular OT is not a must. Walls can be modular if you choose. They could be steel. They could be painted with antibacterial or antifungal paint. Anything which can be cleaned and is non-porous works. Floor. Antibacterial vinyl sheets are something which are very good, very long lasting. Uh, we have in our hospital lasting for almost 15 years. Epoxy coating is good. If you have tiles with minimum joints, that can also work. Stone is a plus minus because most of the stones are porous. You don't get hard stones and stone also have a natural variation. No two stones are alike. But people do use, if you are using some kind of a hard stone, non-porous works, but it is not right ideal. And other thing is the stone also suck the chemicals which are going to use. They are also kind of a sponge. So I would definitely avoid stone, but people are using stone and it works fine and also confirms your HIC. If you're using stone, be choosy about the stone you use. Uh, ceiling, a false ceiling works, but is difficult to clean a metal or a, a you know, a powder coated uh, metal ceilings or a steel ceiling works fine. Whatever you do, make sure that joints are covered so that there is no collection of dust in the joints of the walls of the, you know, the ceiling to the wall. And uh, other thing would be, you would need two entries and exits in your OT. One will be for sterile stuff, one will be for unsterile. You can't have one. So if you have one entry, there may be a second pass box. So you have to plan for two entry and exits, which are not there in most of the eye hospital. And in fact, the doors are also small. You need a bigger door to facilitate movement of stretcher in and out of OT. You could have automated doors. You could ideally have two wing doors, but a single also work fine. A door is something you can really go with what suits you, but those should be hermetically sealed in case you are putting AHU and want to have a positive pressure system. Any leakage there will not let a positive pressure develop. Some examples here, if you see, uh, this is our uh, modular theater with AHU and this indicates there. So we have floor and ceiling. These are all cleanable. These are all modular OT. This is Kumran's OT. If you see, it's all granite and this granite is functioning fine for him. Uh, this is what... Uh, Epoxy looks like these are the walls painted with antibacterial paint, which I'm talking. This is the long sheet. If you see with a single joint here, this is a long sheet. The entire OT will have probably two or three sheets. Uh, this is the vinyl uh, coating, which is for OT. It's a hard vinyl, not the one which you get into market. And this also is impervious. So the whole purpose is the color of the floor should be that if you can see a drop needle or you can see the spillages, it should be easily cleaned. 
and you know you can use chemicals to clean all this stuff wall floor and all and you would have realized during covid when we took extra cleaning protocols how essential the cleaning is so then next important thing is i'll just touch upon is the zones in ot and ot considers of four zones protective zone clean zone aseptic zone and disposal zone I'll just quickly rush through this diagram in protective zones you have your change room rooms for staff stores and records so this is the first area where you enter from outside to the ot then you have a clean zone where you have cssd and you will have your you know induction area transfer in and transfer out rooms and supply rooms and this is the sanctum sector room the aseptic zone which is the ot and the scrub room so these three zones are important and then disposal area where everything goes out now why zoning is important for infection control for efficiency to maintain the flow everything but it is very difficult to get zoning in a single or structure if you see these are two ot if you're making a single ot it is not sometimes possible to get accurate zoning for all four zones but in those cases you have to look at unidirectional flow which is anyway requirement that even in case there is a little issue on zoning the flow should be unidirectional so this is another example of ot if you see there is a corridor system you have a protected corridor you have a clean corridor and you have a dirty corridor below so you could also have this kind of a system so whatever structure you have you are able to fit in some kind of an ot uh, proper ot layout into that this is another thing where there are four ot's if you see and everything sterile is in uh, semi sterile is in center the supply then unsterile is outside so they call it a central corridor this is again one corridor conducting four ot's this is semi sterile and external area is the unsterile one you could have something like this you know where peripheral corridor is there so this red one is the peripheral corridor if you can see so whatever land area you have your architect or people who are well versed with ot designing will be able to provide you some kind of a structure which will have zoning in place this is a flow if you see the green one is a clean flow and orange one is the non clean or unsterile flow so if you see it is coming in one direction going out in one direction with no crossover this is what you should aim to attain in a single ot setup so next would be your electrical thing be very careful for load calculation your ups your raw power you should have multiple power uh, you know points based on the equipment you are going to place don't let wire run on loose on the board a ceiling pendant helps because it gives you the gas supply and it also this is a ceiling pendant you have electrical and you have a gas supply here so this is what you can use look for the dome light attachment so we would have one ceiling and one dome uh, you could also nowadays we need connectivity to the various equipment so you might need to have your lan cables running it and your recording wires and computer terminal to be installed in case you need water where we need water scrubbing and for instrumentation most important thing is in new biomedical act water waste disposal you have to treat the wa water from your ot before you dispose so for water waste disposal you need to have some tanks to you know treat them with pre treat them with sodium hypochlorite this is a retrofit solution because the act change late so it's external tanks if you know now you can actually have the tanks underground doing the same purpose and uh, you need to have an if you don't put a uh, ahu or an hvac system you may be using split ac but whenever you need to upgrade your ot or where things are you should at least leave a provision of fitting in in a proper ahu or hvac system this help us maintain an ot to a iso class 6 standard with proper air changes you also can have a positive pressure of 2.5 or higher pascals you also get control the temperature within the desired range so all this comes with an hvac system or a ahu system other areas which you might need to focus on would be the scrub area in scrub area what can you it can be a metal thing it can be a steel thing it could be other material we prefer steel because it's easy to clean uh, if you have steel fabrication facility it's one of the excellent materials to use in ot then you would be also looking at cssd area uh, where you want to make your cssd and this thing you also need to have gas manifold to store your gas cylinder and provide that gas supply to thing most important once you have done you know sterilization in cssd where do you store your sterile supplies you need to have a place to store your sterile supplies properly and post anesthesia holding recovery area where you are going to have patients and most important in case of emergency uh, this is fire attempts you need to also plan your evacuation of patients from ot and staff from ot the ot's are designed then all the exits are covered or blocked and very difficult to exit out from ot sometime so make sure that you do have your exit plan in place and kept open Uh, that's all i would like to speak in 10 minutes thank you for your kind attention so we'll take discussion in the end uh, our next speaker is dr kumran and uh, he's going to talk on ot protocols and process for hic kumran and me have done almost 20 25 workshops together and his ot talk is absolutely a delight he has his own practice in chennai called kumran eye specialty and uh, center which is a tertiary care specialty he is also alumnus of uh, arvind madurai uh, where i have trained so we do have a same alma mater over to you dr kumran for your talk
Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, Dr. Gagan. I hope I'm audible. Am I audible? Audible. Yes. yes. So, so good afternoon and a warm welcome to all. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Karnataka Ophthalmic Society for this opportunity. And uh, it's been wonderful uh, to be with you all. So my talk is basically on the process and protocols for hospital infection control. Uh, we need to understand that how good a surgeon might be and, and how successful his cataract surgery is. If the uh, pre-operative work of preparing the theater, the, prep, the instrument is not perfect, then it could result in an unsuccessful cataract surgery or whatever surgery it is. As a result, an un as an unsatisfied patients. So we, uh, we all know that the success of any hospital is based on the success of the uh, operating room. You get a good, happy patient, you get more patients. So my talk is basically based on the process and protocols which we, which we need to follow in this process. So news like this are becoming more and more common nowadays. And we need to understand that any healthcare related news is viewed, uh, viewed by the media under the magnifying lens. So uh, having an endophthalmitis or, or any infection in your practice is not a crime. But if that has occurred because of not following certain basic protocols, then it is viewed seriously in the court of law. So my basic talk is going to be on to help the healthcare professionals to prevent or form a program to reduce the, uh, the hospital acquired infection or the hospital infection control program to him, make them design this program and also uh, see, help them to form an effective antimicrobial program. One, one and also second, touch Dr. Upon, Kumaran, yes? uh, can you switch on your slideshow? It is not we coming not in? Seeing, yeah, we are not seeing the slides the are slide coming, show. they are not moving. So just turn Light on show. the presentation mode. Yeah. We can see you now. Can you just reshare again, Kumaran? Is it coming up now? Is it moving? Uh, no, you have to go to the slide share. So you have to go to the presentation mode. Click on down. No? Okay, I'm stopping share now. Share screen. Share screen and then go to the presentation. No? Start slideshow. You're not started the slideshow. Yes, yes please continue. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so the main intent of my talk is to help the healthcare organization to derive a hospital infection control program. So these are the processes on which I'm going to talk through. So the first and the foremost is the, the duty of every doctor to assess the source of infection the, uh, in the patient. And also going to highlight on the hand hygiene, the use of personal protection devices, instrument protocols, and all the processes that are involved in a successful hospital infection control program. So whenever a patient comes in, it is the primary duty of the doctor to assess the source of infection. As we know, the source of infection could be from person to person, clothing, so environment, airborne contaminants, and the hospital staff can also sometimes act as a carrier in transmitting the infection to the other hospital staff and the patients. But one important uh, thing which as ophthalmologists we need to understand is the rare common source outbreaks. In ophthalmology, uh, we use a lot of uh, consumables which are shared among uh, patients, like the BSS, Avastin, and a lot of other things. So we need to keep this particular thing in mind while assessing the infection risk to our patients. So once the infection risk in a patient has been assessed, it is the duty of every hospital infection control uh, a committee to define the antibiotic that has to be used on these patients. It is not a good practice for every doctor to use different antibiotics on a on a particular patient for the same uh, as infection. So the use of antibiotic policy has to be well-defined, preoperative and postoperative antibiotics. And this should be defined on any scientific background and the common uh, as antimicrobial agents and the microbe that is a prevalent in the geographical location. So these are the uh, topics of the words which will be coming across in my talk, cleaning, disinfecting and sterilization. So the whole hospital infection program revolves around this. The use of personal protection devices need not be overemphasized in this era, and it is upon the hospital organization to ensure the right quality, quantity of the personal protection devices that is being available to their staff. And in this era, the use of PPDs in the operation theater and in the uh, OPD almost remains the uh, same. The fundamental or the basic elementary hospital infection control uh, process is the hand wash technique. As you all know, social, aseptic, and surgical hand wash are the ones that has been uh, defined depending upon what process you're going to undertake. The basically hand wash can be timed before you come in contact with the patient, after you come in contact with the patient, during your procedure, and so on. 
So it is always a good practice for every hospital infection control program to have a separate room for all the officials to wash their hand and feet before they enter the theater. As Dr. Gagan said, having a separate entry for the staff and the patient goes a long way in reducing the hospital infection control. And once you enter the theater, always use hand, hand disinfectants and appropriate clothing to enter inside. The, uh, so the street clothes should not be worn beyond the protective uh, zone. And once you enter the theater, your uh, uh, behavior should be very clean. Uh, you should not touch any walls and surfaces which could uh, add on to the hospital uh, spread. The environmental cleanliness is also important as we all know that infection can spread through the uh, environment. So the basic thing an hospital authority should do is to identify all the high-risk areas, like how you identify the infection shows in a patient. The sources of infection in the hospital should also be identified. It starts right from the parking areas, the restrooms, and the waiting areas of the patient. However, there are certain areas in the hospital which needs additional uh, uh, care. For example, the inside of an AHU which you have can harbor growth because the humidity is very high. The curtains, the place where you store your instruments has to be uh, taken care of. The process of cleaning them and adequate surveillance to make sure that the cleaning process is good has to be highlighted. So these are other theaters. These are... Uh, the inside of the operation theater and so, so on. See, I've actually put the a picture of a slipper here because I always tell my staff that after the theater, I always inspect the back of my slippers to make sure that the process of cleaning is good. Okay, uh, BBF is blood and body fluids are cleaning. That should be a clean process and all the staff in the hospital should know how to clean them. So it's always a good practice to have a UV light to make sure that uh, or to identify the areas of spillage because during an, a spillage event, what we see is much less than what we don't see. So the process of BBF cleaning is very uh, as important. Coming to the cleaning schedule, so you always follow a three bucket system where the first two buckets consist of distal water or RO water. The third bucket into which an aldehyde free alcohol based disinfectant is used and always use a clean, dry mop or a cloth and follow the figure of eight bandage. So this is the uh, normal tableau column, which I uh, use for us to, uh, which shows the different timing and the disinfectant used to clean your surfaces. What I would like to highlight here is the neglected ones of the roof and the refrigerator. Most of us forget to clean these areas. It can harbor growth and also create a lot of problem later. Uh, the sodium hypochlorite, a lot of people ask me, what is the best disinfectant to use? Sodium hypochlorite is very effective, the most in, uh, so, uh, uh, as an inexpensive one, but our most hospitals are given this off because of the pungent smell which it creates and it and also erodes your stainless steel. So this tabular column tells you how to prepare a solution of sodium hypochlorite using the different uh, products that are commercially available. So if you have a HVAC system or a non-HVAC system, it is always a good practice to switch on the air conditioner in a HVAC system at least one hour before you start your theater or so that the pressure, humidity, and temperature settings are attained. However, in a non-HVAC system, it is also a good practice to switch on at least an hour before uh, so that all the toxic fumes which you have used to fumigate or other theater is uh, gone, or, uh, gone out. And then comes the uh, sterilization indicators. You need to make sure that all your sterilization indicators are in place. Then your a surgical assistant uh, prepares the Mayo table and use adequate personal protection devices as needed. A small point on the storage of medications which we usually neglect, always follow the, uh, the manufacturer's guidelines on the storage of the medication. Uh, make a note of the expiry of the medication, segregate them at least three months uh, before. We, all, we normally forget to monitor the temperature control or the physical parameters of the place where we store. So having a data logger which shows you the temperature variation even in the place where you store your uh, medicines in the refrigerator or in the CSH area is very crucial. So this is the graph which I've taken from my data logger, which I plug it on all the time, or it can send your information to your Android phone to give you the data about the deviations in the physical parameters. Engineering control is very important. Engineering control has been very clearly defined. This basically eliminates uh, the uh, pathogen right from the uh, source, for example, your UV light or your RO plant. These are all examples of the engineering control. The most important engineering control, which is responsible for the effective functioning of your theater is the HVAC system. I'm just not going to go to go elaborate on this. I'm going to just uh, touch upon what a HVAC system contains. It has three parameters, a hair handling unit, an AC compressor, and a laminar airflow. The inside of the AHU contains the terminal air 
uh, sorry, the pre-filters, which filters the air, cools the air, and then brings it inside your uh, your theta. So the Dr. disinfectant Roman, 10 minutes are up. If you can wrap up, ten minutes are up. Yeah. Okay. I'll just finish in a, in another minute. So this is the backbone of the sterilization uh, process, which contains cleaning, disinfectant, and all the other processes which goes through. So always follow the manufacturer's guidelines when you order clean instruments. Always after the surgery, we clean. Uh, the ancestral instruments has to uh, leave the theater. Uh, they have to be uh, processed with the ultrasonic cleaner. Follow the three bin technique and always pack them using uh, either the non woven paper, plastic paper pouches, and place them vertically before you autoclave. So, the principle of autoclave is well known and follow the three kinds of autoclaves depending upon what kind of uh, uh, as instrument you're going to use. And always follow the quality indicators and keep the, all the indicators in place. The biological indicator uh, worth mentioning is very important and, and you should follow these biological indicator guidelines. So this is the, uh, the tablet column which shows you what indicators has to be used when and where. And OT surveillance is also quite important and uh, the different kind of OT surveillance can be on the engineering control, the methodological survey and the effectiveness of housekeeping. Biological uh, variant, uh, waste management is also crucial. Uh, the management of needle and water, I think, is very important. Reuse policy, as in uh, ophthalmology, we use a lot of reusable instruments. So that should be your policy on the reuse of uh, the instruments. Recall a procedure comes into play with the event of sterilization. And whatever important said and uh, done, post expecture uh, prophylaxis and staff training is very crucial. Quality indicators goes a long way in knowing the effectiveness of all the process which we follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumran. That was a very nice talk. Uh, though we would have loved to hear more, but time is a crunch. But all these things are very practical. Uh, we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Savita Arun. Uh, I don't see her in the participant list. Do we have a recorded presentation of hers? Yes, Dr. I'm playing now. Okay. We'll take questions in the end uh, so that we can have the talks finished. Uh, it's a little tightly packed session. A very good afternoon, uh, one and all. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, COSCON committee bearers for giving me an opportunity to share my uh, uh, thoughts and also uh, some insights into record keeping in OT and CSST. Over the next seven to eight minutes, I will uh, briefly uh, uh, share some of the record keeping uh, process and also the documents that have to be uh, kept mandatory. Universally, record keeping is an essential component in any specialized area in a healthcare organization. These records are not just for the purpose of audits. They're also required for legal purpose and also for preservation. Many a times during audits, we do get questions as whether the records can be maintained uh, in a soft copy or they should be maintained in a hard copy. Computer-based uh, record maintenance is very easy. It is easy for recovery and it occupies limited workspace. Less manpower is required. It is cost effective and it helps in long-term preservation. However, paper-based documents or documents in hard copy are a must where authorization is required. So what is CSSD? It's a key area in any healthcare organization and it's a, where there is centralization of decontamination, assembly, sterilization, distribution and control of sterile items used across the hospital. So what is the objective of CSSD? It is to provide right item at the right place at the right time in the right condition. And the scope is to provide and render service and maintain quality aseptic control procedures. And here the direction is unidirectional and there is a dirty area, semi-clean area and a clean area. So the documentation in CSSD and OT can be uh, maintained under these um, uh, headings for uh, convenience purpose, and I'll briefly go through each one of them. So first one is the documented manual. 
then the validation documents, the logbook and the registers in the OT, the training documents, the staff health checkup, instrument recall and incident reports. So coming to the policies and procedures, in that it is very essential to have a standard operating protocols or procedures that is the SOP in the CSST and the OT. And it is also better to have an organogram where and also there should be a job description and uh, responsibilities in uh, assigned to the OT staff and the CSST staff. There should be also an area layout and there should be a recall procedure. So coming to the validation documents. Validation documents should have the installation uh, uh, details, the operational details of the uh, equipments there, and the performance and the qualification. Like the performance indicators can be the biological indicators, the chemical indicators, and also this validation document should also have daily maintenance, planned preventive maintenance, and breakdown maintenance. Into the validation documents, as I already mentioned, it should have the date and also the operating instructions of the equipments and a copy of the maintenance contract also. It can be maintained even in the biomedical department. However, it is always better to have one in the OT. Coming to the performance indicator, uh, it, it is like sterilization, identification, the batch number, date. Planned preventive maintenance should have date of service request, description of service performed, personnel, who attended and the signature of the person who attended to the work so this so that there is accountability coming to the log books and the registers that have to be maintained it could be either in a soft copy or in a hard copy if authorization is required then it should be in a hard copy like the autoclave registers the sterilization check register the room temperature register microbiological culture report ot disinfection register Medical gases register, medical supplies stock register, the refrigerator temperature register, implant log file, OT consumable sheet, manifold room control record, narcotic drug register, and water quality testing. These are the records that we maintain, and there can be some modifications in the names that we give, and uh, these have to be maintained. These are some of the registers that we are maintaining in our uh, OT, the autoclave temperature register, as you can see, sterilization register, temperature monitoring register, microbiological culture report, OT disinfection register, we have various OTs, so we have named the OTs there, medical gas cylinder uh, register, medical supplies stock register, OT utilization register, refrigerator temperature maintenance register, implant log files, manifold room control register, narcotic drug register, which is kept in a lock and key. This is the maintenance, uh, preventive maintenance. Uh, OT microbiological surveillance, collection of samples, these are from various designated areas, taken from various uh, OT tables. So that was about the various log uh, registers and the uh, files. Next is the training documents. So the training documents should include training done about the departmental policies, that is the OT and uh, CSST water uh, policies and procedures are there. That has to be uh, trained by HR. This will also be maintained in HR, but also can be kept in uh, uh, OT and uh, the validation it should also include the training on validation the infection control practices biomedical waste disposable uh, disposal uh, uh, 
uh, uh, protocols that are trained uh, to the uh, CSSD and the OT uh, staff, handling of uh, hazardous chemicals and the safety protocols. Coming to the adverse event register, this has to be maintained in the OT, which should include instrument recall, where a root cause analysis of the um, uh, e e uh, recall is done and corrective and pre uh, preventive action is also documented. And the incident reports, what are the, uh, the any inc uh, incident that has happened in the OT, the root cause analysis has to be done and corrective preventive action has to be done. So this is the format of the recall register. And what are the uh, soft copies that can be maintained, uh, um, the registers that can be maintained in the soft copy? They are the documented manual, the standard of operating uh, procedures and training records. These can be kept in hard uh, soft copy. And the retention period, it should not be less than two years and permanently documented manual, product certificates and MSDS chart has to be uh, kept permanently. So to conclude, good record keeping is a legal responsibility of the healthcare organization. An ideal record keeping should be correct, complete, and consistent with date and signature. A well-defined record keeping can make it easy to understand what quality work practices have been performed on a daily basis with their quality of manpower that are associated with this work. A good record keeping speaks volumes about the commitment of the healthcare organization for its quality commitment. However, unnecessary collection of data and record keeping can be quite laborious and expensive and can be avoided. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take questions in the end. Can you please stop sharing the screen? Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Pradnya. Uh, she is an anesthetist, also has you know, handles the anesthesia department in two hospitals. That's what I'm aware of. Pradna Netralia with her husband, Dr. Shiram, uh, which we all know, and also uh, handled anesthesia department at Zamida Rai Center. Uh, along with the Zamida Rai Center and uh, Pradna Netralia were the first hospitals to get accredited under the entry level standard when it started. And both of them really put in big efforts. So she was also anesthetist earlier and uh, at Shankar Netralia. And she has got vast experience in case of complications and emergencies, what we see during ophthalmic surgery. Most of us feel that, you know, nothing much happens, but she had a very interesting presentation on that. And she will take us through, you know, what we should do in case of emergencies and how we can prepare for the crash cart or handling of emergencies in ophthalmic anesthesia. Over to Dr. Prat. Thank you so much, Gagan. Uh, I thank Dr. Arun Kumar and KOS for giving me this opportunity today. So my topic is what you need for emergencies, your crash cart. Is it really only your crash cart? If you do not have a trained staff to handle your emergency, then the crash cart is useless. Uh, what is a crash cart? It is a means of storing and transporting vital emergency drugs or equipment to the location of emergency. So ideally a crash cart in a bigger hospital or multi-speciality multi hospital would look something like this. Uh, you can modify your crash cart uh, you can innovate it. Uh, this is my crash cart in my operation theater. So uh, what are the requirements of a crash cart? It has to be tidy, organized crash cart, and all the drawers should be labeled properly. And the staff in charge of the crash cart should memorize the uh, contents and uh, of the drawers. So um, it should also be standardized throughout the institute so that uh, the staff who is in charge of, uh, who, are, who are going to use the crash cart know what is present in each of the drawers. Uh, the ideally a crash cart, the top shelf would contain the defibrillator, the gel for the DC shock, ECG strips, pulse oximeter, BP apparatus, stethoscope, umbo bag with mask and uh, for both adult and pediatrics, gloves, uh, PPE kit, and definitely a defibrillator checklist, incident reporting form and a code blue form. I've added a plastic sheet here because during COVID, what you, if you have a code blue, then you have to do a protected code blue. The first drawer would contain all your medications. The ones labeled in red are the high-risk medication so that the staff is aware that these are high-risk and follow the high-risk medication protocol. So all your ampules should, be, uh, should have a red uh, tape uh, put on it. The second row contain the fluids, 
uh, the third drawer would contain the equipment required to give the medication, like the syringes, the vasofix, the uh, IV dressing, micropore tape, all that. The third, uh, the fourth row would contain equipments for airway management, the, like the laryngoscope, both for adult and pediatric, ET uh, endotracheal tube, oropharyngeal airways, suction catheter, and a tape to fix the endotracheal tube. The arrangement at the side of the card should have an oxygen cylinder, BMW bag, sharps container, and a suction machine. Uh, what are the five helpful arrangement tips for a medical trash card is that uh, it has to be well labeled. The staff should be aware of what is present in each drawer. It should be present in a low traffic area so that you can approach it when an emergency, easily approach it when an emergency occurs. And you should educate your staff, designate one staff who is going to use it, uh, uh, who is uh, responsible for restocking it. You should have an SOP for your trash card. This is my hospital SOP, uh, which will have a policy and procedure. And uh, uh, the procedure would be that the emergency medication box should be stocked by the designated staff. Uh, it will be uh, on consultation with me and your medication box. So if you have a crash cart uh, uh, in a multi-speciality hospital, what, what it is that it has a cover and the cover has a zip and it is locked and the lock and key, uh, the key is keep, kept with the staff in charge. But in a smaller hospital like mine, uh, what I have done is I have an em emergency medication box, which is sealed with a micropore tip, tape. And that tape will be open only when the box is open. That is in a case of emergency for when it is to be restocked. This is necessary so that it is not open by anyone and any time. And this is very important because in case you have opened it and not restocked it, so you wouldn't have put the tape again, and then you will not have that emergency drug when another emergency occurs. Uh, the, uh, the emergency drug form should be kept uh, in the OPD as well as in the OT, and there should be a checklist which has to be checked by the staff. Uh, this is the uh, equipment checklist. So uh, you, would, you would have the name of the equipment, the quantity, when it is checked, and who has checked it. On the back box, you could have a label like this, which will have the box number. Suppose, see, uh, in an ophthalmic setup, I don't see many emergencies. I wish there are no emergencies, but if an em if uh, but still you have drugs in it, and the drugs have an expiry date. So the earliest expiry date of the drug, uh, one of the drug which is kept in the thing, should be lab should be put on the label so that the staff, when checks, knows that this is going to expire within a one month time and opens the box and restocks the drug uh, the ex, uh, uh, the drug which is going to be expired you should have a, a medication checklist like this where you will have the generic name of the medication the strength of the medication the expiry date of the medication how much of quantity uh, uh, of ampules are present and who has checked it and who has replaced it and with the signature and date so why a crash card in an ophthalmic setup do you need it Yes, uh, the emergencies are very rare in an ophthalmic setup, but you can have an emergency and you should be prepared. So most of why uh, there can be emergencies because most of your patients are geriatric age group with have may have comorbidities. And there is, I have seen inadequate pre-op preparation in most of the ophthalmic setup and anesthesiologists are not always present. And unfortunately, ophthalmologists, because of their curriculum, are inex inexperienced in handling emergency. So when you prepare for emergency, they cease to exist. Uh, what are the common emergencies? Uh, commonest would be a vasovagal or a hypoglycemia, but all these emergencies which I have cited, I have seen in my practice. This is a protected uh, code blue training mock drill, which I am doing in my hospital. A uh, continual training of your staff is extremely necessary because when there is an emergency, they should be able to handle it. What I have done in my hospital, in the other hospitals which I visit, uh, I have made a chart uh, with common emergencies and what are the signs and symptoms and how you are going to manage it. And I have pasted it in the critical areas like the OT and the OPD. And I, I encourage my staff to uh, keep looking at them so that they can actually memorize them and they'll be able to handle an emergency uh, better when it comes. So um, a want of time, uh, I will just 
cite these case scenarios which has happened in my practice and I've uh, managed to handle them well. A 55 year old male patient with IDDM, IHD, hypertension and CKD posted for vitrectomy complaints of breathlessness and uneasiness. Patient is tachypneic, has tachycardia and wants to immediately set, sit up. What will you do? 70 year old female with IDDM, hypertension posted for cataract surgery becomes very uncooperative after block. Patient has tachycardia and sweating. What will you do? 35-year-old male is posted for skin surgery. The ophthalmologist notices that the patient has become unresponsive after block. Monitor shows a flat line. What will you do? A 30-year-old male has come to the OPD for routine checkup. Ophthalmologist notices that the patient looks pale and is uneasy. And when he sits on the chair, uh, pulse oximeter shows a pulse rate of 164 per minute. What will you do? So we can take it in question answer session. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pradnya, and uh, we definitely saved some time here. We're running a bit late. Uh, we'll move on to next talk and then probably come for questions at the end. That way we'll have a better time management. So the next talk, maintenance of machine, there's a switch. Dr. Chandrasekhar is going to take that talk and he's also going to cover his talk, do's and don'ts on cluster and ophthalmitis after that. He has to rush to the other session so he would finish his talk and go. I'm unable to see Dr. Namita here in the audience list. Uh, if Dr. Namita is here, is it okay with you if you change the session? Uh, they will talk to the last. So over to Dr. Chandrasekhar for his talk. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Am I audible and my slide is visible? Yeah, your audible slide yeah. is visible. Thank you. Greetings to all of you, all my colleagues here, my co-speakers, and all the people who are attending online and will be seeing it in the near future when it is available online. My talk is going to be first on maintenance of machines. And the second one is going to be do's and don'ts in case of cluster endophthalmitis. I'd like to cover this in 25 minutes. And most of the topics have been covered by Kumaran and Gagan. So it will be easier for me to rush through all the images and examples of Arvind Coimbatore and from net only for teaching purposes, no financial interest. So basically any equipment in a hospital could be either a biomedical equipment or a utility equipment. Biomedical would be all those things involved in diagnostic and therapeutic measures whereas utility equipment or light, AC, fan, and so on. So with this in mind, we will talk about the OT equipment. In the CSSD, we have the autoclaves, the sterilizers, the ultrasonic cleaner and sealing machine, and so on. In the operation theater, we have the microscopes, PECO machines, vitrectomy machines, diathermy, and not to forget, the most important topic uh, my previous speaker spoke is about monitors and defibrillators. Very important, whether we are a small hospital or a big hospital, we never know when an emergency will occur. So these are biomedical equipment, we commonly call it as BME. They are all hospital medical equipment in simple words. We need this to maintain it properly so that we get a full efficiency of the machine and the reliability will be good. It can be done in-house or outsource. Efficiency is most important for us to do this maintenance periodically. And from the start of installation to condemnation, the biomedical equipment will be in charge of these machines and training is part and parcel of maintenance of these machines. Most important for a biomedical equipment department, be it small hospital or big, is to have a manual. These tell how we should do, who should do and what should be done. Without these kind of, it's something like a Bible for biomedical. We do not know because there will be variations with different people working at different times. So this is primary important. We need to have manuals. The manuals are these things like, you know, this is the operator manual given by the company. So they will actually give us complete important do's and don'ts and so on. But at the root level, user level, we need to create the SOP. So that is important and they know what to do. Most of the periodic maintenances are done by the in-house if there is any department and they should know what to do and the standard checklist will help. Most important, we need to have the contact person name and their number to contact in terms of some of the smaller hospitals may not have a backup machine at all. So the whole process of business will get stopped if it is a big uh, instrument and we are in a remote place and they take lots of days to come. Then we need to have something called the equipment history card. The complete history when it was installed, what is the type of machine, which company and the model. For, so every model will be different for every instrument we need to have a separate thing. For every model, we'll have the manual. So we have to make our address, contact person, preventive maintenance, every history about this 
when was the last then when we have to do the next maintenance whenever there is breakdown maintenance and all those things including annual maintenance contract for bigger machines it is essential that we have a annual maintenance contract so you can see how these things are entered and everything is done the most important is there is something called asset management hospital as assets asset should be numbered like our uin these numbers are also unique you cannot repeat the same number to other people at all, other machines at all because it will be kept for a longer time and we need to know what's happening to that particular machine irrespective of any number of machines you have each machine will have a number so it will have all the data in the if you have a system like this it is absolutely good it will give you a reminder you will know whether you completed you can calculate the statistics and so on so that is or either it can be done manually or through the automation now coming to maintenance we have got two maintenance plans one is for preventive you do a periodic preventive maintenance plans the other one is whenever the machine is down the breakdown maintenance and for most of the machines we need to calibrate to make sure that they are working in 100% efficiency the equipment maintenance can be done internally if you have a, 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 a department in the hospital or externally who can come and do it it will act according to your annual maintenance contract these kind of stickers are put on each machine the number the name what is that pm on when it was done when is the next due date so that is important so this is how you make a plan like how we have a chart planning everything is planned depending on the number of instruments you have when it will be done when is the next date and so on so this will give a complete overview of how we are going to manage in the hospital small hospitals mostly the manager and the facility maintenance person will be looking into it frequency it can be as much as good as one week or even days or one month or three months depending on the type of instrument how frequently used and the criticality of that instrument and which are vulnerable to wear and tear where it can become when it becomes older fuse will become more when there is fluctuation and then you have to this frequency is not fixed it will depend on the type of machine we use calibration very important to make sure at least once in a year it is always done by a third party who are authorized to do calibration of machines so we should know the parameter that calibration all these are important parameters if there is a breakthrough or outbreak in the infection or something these things will give us lot of legal value for example i give you some equipment ultrasonic cleaner you need to have temperature 50 degrees time required for them to work then you also have the indicators for ultrasonic cleaning getting a producers one it will be like a aluminum foil where holes will form in the foil to make sure that ultrasonic cleaner is working pre steam pre vacuum we don't use the vertical autoclave because it does not have a vacuum cycle so these are the parameters which everybody knows 120 degree temperature steam is 18 to 10 tlb and time of 20 minutes so you need to look at the boiler water level sensor heat heater safety value and machine gasket leak test all these are done as part of periodic maintenance the eto you all know it is a toxic gas so we should be very careful you have to know that it is 100% gas if there should never be a leak if there is a leak you tell these people to put it in a bucket of water take it to the top open terrace and leave it because it can be carcinogenic these are the parameters we have so these are all done by checklist if we don't have any checklist we are likely to miss they should not put a tick without seeing they have to make sure that is how the efficiency of work will work now checks to be performed before starting cycle would be look at the cartridge check the water container regulator unit for more than 75 psi and so on and so forth so this is for all the instruments we have a checklist now validation is important where the preventive maintenance team they will look at the book also there may be something that would have been overlooked by the cssc team there could be some variation which will give a clue that the machine is not 100% potential so these are physical ones you can have a print out you can have electronic display or a gauge which you know class 1 or only process indicators it will say the machine has been switched on and off only the color change will say and you can have the expiry there so you can see the change from blue to black for steam and eto is eto is blue to green here you see the right one is on top is the correct one but other places you have dull places no black line at all so they are all failures so you need to make sure it is done under 134 degrees kept in the middle of the autoclave now it comes to the pack so it will come with papers in front and back and you make sure it checks a vacuum cycle it is class 2 indicator it checks the vacuum levels you can even use the use the process challenge devices now class 5 and 6 are the best because they see temperature steam and time 
So if we survive, it will have a bar, it crosses the bar, but six will occur only on optimal uh, parameters for that. This is the breakdown maintenance. The service pa 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 your agent will come, he will check it up, get your signature, make sure it is working, and then this is the breakdown service report. Operating microscopes, everything is looked up, how to clean the lens, what is the, it is all there in SOP. How to check the foot pedal, every part has got a function, then how to change the bulb. Everything is done during the prevent, preventive maintenance. Peco machine, at least weekly we do because there is a lot of usage and it is very, very critical that it should not stop during functioning. So everything including touch screen display, prime tune, functioning, handpiece irrigation and aspiration function and all should be checked. You have to give importance to all the complaints made by the user because they will give you clues as to what is the problem. So you have to look at it very critically and make sure it is not reported. So all the users will give complaints. Downtime, this is very important. You have to have equipment downtime and critical. Equipment is any equipment you calculate how many minutes it has been not working. So the average of it is calculated. For example, for major work, it can be 28 hours less than around a day. For minor work, it can be only minutes. So this is how you calculate at the end of the day to see the efficiency of the only pending work of the biomedical equipment. List of critical equipment or not many, boils, multi-para monitor, where it is very essential for the management of critical patients systemically. So here you can see how many works, minor works, everything. So critical equipment downtime is also equally important in NABS. Training, induction on coming to the department, even if it's a senior person, you have to teach the culture so that there is no deviation according to your manual. Whenever there is a new equipment or repeated errors and near misses, we need to do. All the records are legal documents to show if there is any cluster outbreak. And it is also good for you to follow up and for auditing. Hint for users, tell them how to look at the plug, where to do, how to pull, not to pull the wire and keep the electrical devices, when to switch off. This checklist should be available for the users. This is in short of what we should do as doctors about how equipment in the hospital are managed. So thank you uh, so much. I think I will take the next 15 minutes to talk about the do's and don'ts. Any comments, uh, Dr. Gagan, before I switch on the next PowerPoint? No, we can finish all and have yeah. all questions and for time. Yeah, management. I'm, just, I'm just switching on my... Uh, PowerPoint. Okay, one minute. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, this is another important topic. It is totally a different topic, but it is very important for all of us to know if a cluster occurs, pray to God, endophthalmitis never occur and cluster never ever occurs. So, this yes, is sir, something. You're not in presentation mode. Oh, okay. You're in reading mode. No, no. This Just is not. Bottom right mode. corner. Huh? Bottom right corner, please press again. Bottom. No, right. no, no. This is easier. No, actually, you don't. I want a full, full screen like this. Yes. You can see. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. No. Oh. Yes or no? No, no, sir. Is it a full screen mode now? Yes. Yeah, it's come now. It's come. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we need to understand. It is a very important topic for us to know. Hoping and praying it will never ever occur. That's all. That is in one word. So now we are going to talk about what we should be doing. If you see one also, it's a nightmare for any surgeon. If you see many like this, it is a nightmare of nightmares. Cluster endophthalmitis, post-op, it is hydrogenic. Or it could be endogenous, which becomes a cluster. So these are the things we must know. Generally, a surgical site infection is within, the th within 30 days. But when we put implants, we say it has to be within 90 days. So what is a cluster? In general, the books will say, Five cases on a single day or continuously every consecutive day cases are occurring, it has to be considered a cluster. But as with the experience of having a lot of clusters, I've gone to work up in different hospitals and a couple of clusters where I've gone personally to treat and probably involved in a cluster in a small hospital in that, a missionary hospital where it became and it was solved. Even a single case or two may be a warning of a cluster to occur. So we don't think that we have to prevent only cluster. Idea is to prevent end of thalmitis. Today, clusters do occur. Even recently it has occurred, may not be reported in many cases. Some come out through media reports and much improved protocols we have in India. We have to identify before things go wrong. Antibiotic and vitrectomy have played a major role. There are reports like this, very good reports are there. These are the reports and these are the kind of incidents 
that gave us a lot of lessons. We have seen a lot of uh, IGO articles also, what is happening. And what I'm going to tell is based not only on these reports, but some practically what has been happening in and around. ESCRS study shows intra, uh, you know, when you give intracameral injection, it reduces by five times approximate. And when we give intracameral MOXIE, as in our India Arvind study, it reduces four times the chances of end of thalamus. Where do they occur? Irrespective of whether it's a one man, one operating room to a multi speciality hospital or regional institute, it can occur. Once a cluster occurs, you don't panic. There is always an internal conflict, but you don't want to tell other people it has occurred. So they do not panic. You have to follow some protocol. You have to manage the patients. That is primary importance. Today, with daycare, you send them home and they come in different times, then they will not be. But if you're keeping them in the hospital within no time, one person will tell the other person that I am not well, you are not well. And that will become a major problem to solve also. You have to stop the OT when there is a cluster. Work up to find the source. The early diagnosis, expert management lines and protocol, referral. Many people fail to refer in small hospitals to a retina surgeon or a higher center. Otherwise, that can only worsen that. So this you can never hesitate to talk to them. Ideally, the patient is the most important. You have to do that. It is also the duty to inform the District Blindness Control Society. You have to keep all records. Where could be the source? You can see from the theater, environment, IV flu, including COVID-19, I have investigated, investigated a case of cluster. So it can be the personal of assisting sister as being the cause for a series of clusters, which was proven genetically also by the organism and what was there. So anywhere, including the restrooms, restrooms are sometimes the source for infection. It can be with respect to environment, sterilization, medicine, personal patients. So what you see is you're going to work up. Do not try to say we are doing the best. So many years we have done, but we have to find out there is probably a small cost that has caused the cluster. If you do not do that, it may become difficult. What you're doing is going to also give a legal value when it goes to court. You don't want microorganisms, including spores there. So in the AC, definitely no split uh, window AC. Split AC is acceptable provided you have a protocol. And these are today the best. HIPAA filters are there. You don't even have to have fumigation. You can see how there is a HIPAA filter which can filter up to 0.3 microns at a efficiency of 99. There is no role for fogging if you have a HIPAA, but you can do fogging provided you do not use formalin anymore. It is not accepted because it is carcinogenic. Vircon, bacillus seed, aldosone, so many are available. The cleaning protocols inside the OTE and everywhere the patient is has to be done. The solution, they are all taken as per the best practices. Dilution should be proper, unidirectional method of closing. So these furnitures inside are nidus for infection. Sometimes they're never removed. And those things will have infection. Suddenly it will blast off like a cluster. Vertical autoclave is never, uh, the steam autoclave is the most famous. And for low, wherever you have uh, heat uh, sensitive instruments, you can use the ETO, which will get probably moved out of circulation in the world in the next few years, and then plasma will come to play. These indicators, you know, uh, these are the methods to see whether they are functioning properly. As I said in my instrument, we are going to see how it is work. I'm already, uh, I've already done this, so I'm going to skip this, because these things will be looked. We will never know when the inspecting team sees, no, there will be one small biological thing where the number count will be more or a chemical indicator, which is great. So they won't look at yesterday, today and all. They will look at it. So you have to make sure the people who are involved in that will know everything about it. So these are the indicators. Then the biological indicator is a very important thing. For autoclase, we use stereothermophilus, uh, geobacillus and bacillus atrophius for ETO. So these things can be incubated at 37 for atrophius and 57 for serothermophilus. Now rapid in, uh, incubators have come where we'll know based on the enzyme reaction within two to three hours also. So the color change, you must have a control. These are the gold standards for validation, the biological end. How often should we do microbiological surveillance? Actually, according to NPCB, it is to be done ideally once in two weeks. And this is how we will do settle plates and swab. Today, actually, the settle plates have got more value than the swab. But as a routine, we have to take the swabs also, which was explained beautifully. Then the fluids, how do we manage? Fluids are the cause for infection many times, whether it is a visco, whether it is a ringer lactate or the balanthol solution. 
So we'll write down the batch expiry number and traceability for every patient, whatever is done. It's a good practice to take one sample from each batch and check for microbiological surveillance before it is brought into the OT for usage. So that is a good practice. Wherever they have a micro department, this is not expensive, but to give it out, it will be the irrigating fluids. You should know the batch number glass. You know, when you put a vacuum test, there should be bubble. It is better to inspect against a white background and a black background if it is up. And today we have good double packed uh, ringer lactates and balance all solution. They are good, but these are good to be seen if it is a glass bottle. The records, which has been dealt very nicely in the previous week, are all legal evidences you have to prove once a cluster occurs, you have to prove that you have been doing rightly and nothing wrongly. So it is our nothing but record. If it is not documented, not done. If you don't have the manual, it will not be done. If there is a sterilization failure, you need to rework on your machine also. This is also part of your workup and management. Otherwise, you will land up in clusters again and again. Anytime any of the failure is there, actually ideally biological indicative to run the machine three times. If it fails three times, it is totally, the machine is not functional at all. You have to recall whatever has been given along with that batch has to be recalled back to the autoclave or the CSSD and make sure wherever it is used, you have, even if there are other patients who have been done, you have to recall, find out, and you may probably be taking more uh, medical treatment or preventive aspects for them not to become a bigger problem. So check the machine also. This workup of sugars, pressure, looking for septic focus will go a long way. One thing we must remember, even an end of, which is going to be single, if you don't have an intermediate protocol in between cases, you are sharing instruments, you are sharing some consumable from here, this single end of can become a cluster end of thalmitis. So nasolacrimal duct patency is sometimes missed, and that is a major cause for end of, it can also spread. Ovidonidin is a big boon as because it can clear all the organisms. We don't have to talk about preoperative, paraoperative, and postoperative antibiotics. It is a major role apart from the uh, other tasks. All this, you know, whatever you do, are these principles of HIC. These are standard protocols and precautions which will prevent an infection from occurring. So important don'ts, preparing all trolleys half an hour, one hour before the surgery starts. Unsterile person just using the cheetle forceps and preparing, again an infection, they all become clustered. Throwing around soil linen on the floor. Remember, any wet linen can catch up the organism within a few hours. Discarding swabs used for skin on the floor. When sterility is in doubt, water is a problem. Anywhere there is a doubt, benefit of doubt will go only to the patient, patient, patient. You have to stop. Linen should be removed immediately. Soil linen should be removed. No crossing over of anything from one surgery to another. Especially when we do shared tables in the same OT, these things can become a cluster in no time. So complications occur, you have to give more importance to this patient, the chance of end of. Remember, you know, we have many ways of putting them. One cluster, one in front of can become a cluster also. Though there is a sterilization failure, there is a fluid which is the cause. Everything should be kept. Case records have to be absolutely perfect as said previously. They have to be filled up at least two to three times a day, making sure you're doing the round. If better to take a photograph and scan. Any investigation, we scan. Take a printout and do, don't just write it. At least three rounds per day. Condition explained to, it is easier to explain on day one and two rather than day eight when a problem occurs. And you get the signature that it's being treated, everything. This will go a long way. It may become a big case, but your consent form, informed consent form and all this will save you. Definitely it will save you. Prompt referrals are the order of the day if you do not have this specialist there. The people involved should know about fumigation, autoclaving, surveillance. The team will ask everybody what they are doing directly and without anybody's knowledge, help, you can have to answer. The logbooks, including the theater logbook, surveillance, autoclave, flash, everything will be an important parameter for the team, uh, investigating team to see. You have to explain to the patients and the attender. It can become public or not. Many do not become public, but... We need to keep everything in place. Don't think it will not become. Even two cases can go public. One case can go public. So case or the thing is there. Suddenly one day it will come because the most of what they do is they go to the road and they block the road. That's all. The whole media will be there in three and a half minutes. 
the lawyer would have already met them and put a case against the hospital. The lawyer will give them the money, all poor patients, especially in camp, and say, I will take this case, you keep this money. Once the money comes, you will split it 50-50. Unfortunate to say this, but this has happened and it will happen. Then you will only come to know directly by seeing the paper or somebody will call or they will call asking you and we must understand it's a very difficult situation. You have to tackle attenders and the public, tackle media. You have to better inform your state association, the ophthalmic and IMA. They can protect in a way. That's all. The investigating team could be seven or eight. You can have a dean, JD, ophthalmologist and microbiologist coming up. DBCS can come separately. State blindness will come. Drug inspector will come. A police inquiry will come. Human rights and all these people will come. What an inspection team looks, they have a standard checklist for all this. There will be a technical person who is an ophthalmologist with part of the government team. First thing they will see is your license to run the hospital, whether you have a clinical establishment act license or not. If that is not there, whatever you have done correctly, you will still be at fault. Remember, the statutory licenses are foremost important, including Tamil Nadu Pollution Control Board license. They are not there. That For that, they can be in life. Then the environment, everything, as I said, every part of it. For example, in one cluster, they saw the consumable, which was taken for two years to see whether a gloves was stained for every case, whether the povidone is so much used, whether every con uh, consumption of the better was checked for two years and tried to correlate with what you say and then whether you use separately or shared. So these are some things which are becoming very important legally because for every person, it is their eye. So we, it is our duty to make sure end of doesn't occur and protection for doctors. This is something which we learn. They cannot be arrested for medical reasons at all, unless it's a criminal act. Unless it's a criminal act, they cannot be arrested unless the technical team says it is a fault. It is negligent. Otherwise, it is our duty to prove that there has been no negligence and part of the hospital or the doctor. So this is oh, something sure. which everybody should do. Yeah, two minutes. Okay, so a surgeon will be affected, threatened, or wrong surgery can be performed. This is something which happened in wrong surgery performed, cause loss of one organ, forcefully retained. And you can also say uh, they were threatened to beat or something like that. So much they will put light, but we have to face it. Hospital will be closed. Cluster end of thalmitis, there is no immunity at all. We have to take prevention is better than a cure outcome. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, Dr. Lalit was the first to organize first workshop for AOS to bring out guidelines. But today, NABH, which is under the government of India and the Indian Ministry of Commerce, will give a lot of legal value if you follow. Lacks of surgery is done, but one case can finish the entire name of the hospital. Very sad, we offer high standards of surgical skills, but due to compromise at different levels, low or high, these tragedies occur. We work, 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 but we have to review. We still cannot justify sharing of apron, gloves, instruments, FACO set, FACO or uh, tips and knee, everything, uh, uh, chambers. So we have to rethink about sharing anything. Zero percent is still a dream or reality. We don't know. But we can still attain. Endogenous, we cannot prevent 100 percent. Hydrogenic hospital acquired infection can be really prevented. Thank you so much for exceeding. Uh, sorry for exceeding a minute or two. Again, thanks, everybody. That's OK. We are on time. Uh, yeah. We don't have audience questions, so uh, we can definitely get a few minutes there. So we move on to our last talk, that is Biomedical Waste Disposal by Dr. Namita Anagol. I think so, it's a recorded. Jyoti? Yes, Dr. Amshare. Yeah, please. So this will be the last talk. Uh, Dr. Chanshekar, any comments on uh, previous presentation because we are leaving for the next session? Anything you would like to add to what we had? Uh, actually, Gagan. It's been good and you know, we have such a short time to talk about so much beautiful, but I think each of the speakers justified the talk and gave what is important in a nutshell. So actually it will be nice to have question answers and each of them can take it. Every talk was given in a very nice 10 minute, beautifully described and I'm sure the uh, people who will be seeing it in future also will gain some important points. Correct. Dr. Kumran, anything till we move on to our last presentation you'd like to add? Dr. Pradhan, would you like to add something? Uh, we have some time till Jyoti is loading the presentation. I just wanted to ask Dr. Chandrasekhar one question. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, is it a good idea, uh, is it a good practice to uh, do a culture of the um, 
irrigation fluid and visco which goes into the eye of the yeah. batch if you get a particular batch that batch one sample you can take and do culture before you use that batch is it okay i mentioned it in my talk madam every okay. medicine which is a fluid before getting it into the theater we do a batch testing for microbiological survey surveillance but okay. if that doesn't 100% prove because one of the bottles can be have the seal broken but it's a good practice to make sure of all see for example we have we had intravitreal injections causing cluster all over the country so then that the whole thing was banned we do that regularly at arvin madam it is always a good and practice only for smaller hospitals the cost will be much more to send it out i do uh, there is a solution to that uh, there is a solution to that like you know uh, pradna and all if you have smaller hospitals i do believe you work in a group so if you are in a group you can actually share the cost because you eventually buy the same batch so yes in many places people do order the same batch and then the cost can be divided so someone taking lead with all can be done so depends upon how you practice and how things are so absolutely absolutely so we'll move on to our last presentation and if some time is left we'll come back to the discussion uh, jyoti yeah. is ready for the presentation of dr namita good afternoon everybody i'm dr namita the infection control officer of nitadhama super specialty i hospital bangalore at the outset i would like to thank the karnataka of talmic society and chairman scientific committee dr elen for giving me an opportunity to share my views today i'll be talking on biomedical waste disposal biomedical waste is a waste that is generated during diagnosis treatment or immunization of human beings or animals or in any research activities why do we need a biomedical waste disposal policy It's a very important question we need to know. Biomedical waste poses a potential threat to the surroundings, environment, persons handling it, and to the general public. Around seventy-five percent of hospital waste is general waste. Twenty-five percent is biomedical and hazardous waste, of which only ten percent is infectious. In the year nineteen ninety-eight, the bi biomedical waste legislation was formulated. new regulations were formed in 2016 and amendments were brought about in 2018 the various schedules in the waste management include the schedule 1 which includes category type of waste color coding containers and treatment option the schedule 2 is a standard of treatment and disposal of biomedical waste schedule 3 is a list of prescribed authorities and their corresponding duties and schedule 4 includes Part A is the labeling of the biomedical bags, and Part B is barcoded labeling for transportation. The first thing we need to do is classify hospital waste. Hospital waste can be classified into infectious, non-infectious, hazardous. Infectious include the sharps, human anatomical, and biomedical waste. Non-infectious are the kitchen organic waste, plastic recyclable, and discarded medicines. And the next group is hazardous, like the various chemicals we use in the hospital for cleaning, for disinfection, and for pest control, etc. Handling of biomedical waste is very important. Proper personal protective equipment has to be used by the staff when they are handling this waste, like gloves, masks, caps, aprons, shoes, etc. Now the various steps in biomedical waste management include segregation of waste at source, collection of the waste, storage of the waste, transportation to end treatment facility, and final treatment and disposal of waste. The most important and essential step of biomedical waste disposal is segregation of the waste at source. Why is segregation the most essential step? It's as simple as. Uh, as it's anybody's guess see as i had said before 75% of the hospital waste is non infectious so if a segregation is not done at source the 100% of this waste becomes infectious next the housekeeping staff has to again segregate it and the chance of injuries and adverse event during collection can be very high the 2016 rules have divided biomedical waste into various categories Category one is the yellow category, which includes human anatomical waste, animal anatomical waste, soil waste, expired or discarded medicines, chemical waste, chemical liquid waste, and discarded linen which have been contaminated. Second category is the red category, which is contaminated waste which is 
recyclable like syringes, urine bags, tubings, IV tubes, sets, catheters, etc. White is the waste that is shops like your blades, scalpels, etc. And blue is the glassware. And these are the various standard charts which are available. And sometimes some variation may be in the standard uh, disposal of waste because these are sometimes detected by the end treatment facility, which will give you a chart of their own to suggest what goes into which container. So coming to the color coding of biomedical waste, these are the standard color coding containers which we have, the yellow container for infected, the red for recyclable, black is general waste, and blue is glassware. These are sharp containers and these are the cytotoxic waste. Color-coded bins are also available in the outpatient wherein we have a smaller sharp container because the amount of sharps which are used in the ophthalmic setup is less. And we have displayed charts in each consultation room like this. So for people to segregate the waste correctly. This is a chart which I was speaking about. We have the yellow, the red, the blue, the sharp containers and the cytotoxic. Disinfection of needles is a very basic step and all the needles have to be disinfected uh, with 1% sodium chloride. Uh, once the sharp is segregated, then there's a storage facility. A storage facility should be under lock and key and the same color coded containers are there. Each storage facility can store up to a maximum of 48 hours. After that, they have to be transported to the end treatment facility. An MOE will be available with the end treatment facility for collecting the waste. And these are documented as to how much of weight is collected and what is the type of waste. Any adverse events which occur during the waste is noted. An important thing amendment which happened in 2016 was a barcoding of biomedical waste pack to track these waste as to from where they are coming. The important, next important thing what we need to know is the liquid waste management. Waste water from the OT sink will come into this uh, waste collection wherein we have the uh, outlet uh, here. It contains sodium hypochlorite, which is continuously pumped into this storage tank. And after minimum contact time of about an hour, it then gets in, uh, discharged into public sewer. We have a simple mechanism where we are able to uh, disinfect our liquid waste before we discharge into public sewer. With this, I would like to conclude my talk and it and uh, important for all of us to remember, let the waste of the sick not contaminate the lives of the healthy. A simple step from each one of us and a change in of our attitude will bring out a lot of change in the way we handle biomedical waste. Thank you so much. And I once again, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of this session. A uh, couple of speakers are not there, so I'll request Dr. Kumran for his comments or questions. And then if there's any audience question, we can take. Is there any audience questions, Gagan? There's no audience uh, questions. No audience questions, so we can have your uh, last comments. Uh, yeah, so it's been a wonderful session. So uh, I think it's been a very uh, good talk by everyone. But unfortunately, it's a huge topic to be covered in such a short time. So probably in the upcoming conferences, we have more time we could touch upon the hospital infection control uh, protocols and processes. Otherwise, it's been a wonderful talk and I thank all the other speakers for being a part of this. Thank you, Gagan. I see Raju staring at me to vacate for his session. Hi, Raju. Yeah. So we'll yeah. give you a time. Uh, very interesting session. The only thing I would like to talk about all the speakers is that all topics were very difficult to wrap up in 10, 11 minutes. Most of the point, important points were covered by all the speakers and they are really must. We have left out so many things. But then this entire thing is actually a one day workshop to have it in, you know, 70, 80 odd minutes. I really thank all the speakers to, you know, it shows their experience and it shows that, you know, they really know the subject well to bring it into, you know, such small capsule. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, audience. And we hand it over to Raju for next session. Thank you. Uh, okay.